we have Matt Miller here today. He is a cannabis intellectual property, trademark, copyright, all that good stuff lawyer in New Jersey. Um, whenever people ask me who I recommend locally, I always say his name. He did mine. Um, so that is personally, I, I wouldn't send you guys somewhere I wouldn't go. But um, okay, so this is not the most sexy topic when we talk about trademarks. <laughs> it is not something like, I want to... I want to start a business so I can worry about my trademark property. No, it's not. But it is a super important one because if you screw this up, you could put a lot of work into something that gets ripped away, which is what happened to me um, 10 years ago. My business was originally called Mary Jane Mix. Now, oh. I didn't do my homework on that, uh, that mark, and it ends up being owned by the parent company of Tasty Cake, which is... Oh. <laughs> which is not someone you can fight. So, no. um, no, no. So I, um, I'll tell that whole story on my own time. I'm doing a, a side thing called tales from the trail, which is for Patreon subscribers who can, uh, who can hear all my lessons learned the hard way in cannabis. But wow, so like cool series. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so check that out, but let's get started with the right way. So someone comes up with an idea for their business and cannabis. What's the first step? Um, yeah, geez, where, where do you start? So, uh, I mean, the joke, the joke is you can ask a lawyer any question and they're going to say it depends. And, uh, lo and behold, it also depends here. So you know, yeah. the, the joke is true. Um, so, I mean, first off, I guess if you're going to start a cannabis business, first bit is, can you do it in your state? Right. You know, there's a lot of confusion as to, I mean, obviously like straight up marijuana, a lot of people, you know, everybody knows you can't sell that, but like, yeah. what about hemp? How do you define hemp versus marijuana? What are mm -hmm. those distinctions? Um, yep. You know, getting a handle on that stuff would be probably a good place to start. Sure. Uh, so, but, but know, so, so say yeah, someone's done their legwork, they've got, oh, you know, their ducks in a row and they're like, okay, I can start an ancillary or a CBD or I'm going to apply for a dispensary, whichever it is. Um, before they pick that name, what homework is you know, required reading, whatever, to make sure they're picking a name that's not going to get yanked away from them before they even call you. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, obviously, Google the name. Uh, that sounds like a little too common sense, but uh, often the answer is staring you right in the face, you know, just like a yeah. two second Google search. I always tell clients, I'm like, yeah, of course, I'm happy to look up the name for you. But like, if you just do a little bit of Googling and find it, you've saved yourself a pretty yeah. penny. And, uh, you know, like, do that before you yep. give me anybody. So um, obviously Google it. Um, I, I do my searching. There's the, the, so the agency, the federal agency that oversees this stuff is the United States Patent and Trademark Office, or as I'll probably just call it, the PTO. USPTO.gov. Uh, and... During my lawsuit, I spent a lot of time there. <laughs> yeah, that's, oh, no, that's, uh, that's exactly right. I, yep. I too spend a lot of time there even today. Um, yep. But on there, there's a system. So it's, it's alphabet soup. It's called TESS, the Trademark Electronic Searching System. Uh, but really what you folks at home should know, it's tmsearch.uspto.gov. Uh, or if you go to the PTO's website, it's in the top right corner. You can just search it there. And that's like the official database. And honestly, it's, it's pretty good. I, I, it's kind of counterintuitive. You would think the patent side of the trademark office would have like all their technology in order and it's all really good. And that's a uh, complete shit. Uh, uh, can we curse on this? <laughs> we can, we uh, can curse. Yeah. Uh, you can yeah. Say anything it's complete you want. Shit. Uh, Director Ayanku, <laughs> like it's shit, man. You know, yeah. it's shit. Like make it better, please. Uh, mm -hmm. and they are, they are. Uh, there's like a new system, but um, the trademark side is excellent. Like seriously, whoever's on charge of that is doing a phenomenal job and tests the trademark searching systems really good. So yeah. obviously type your name there. That's a good start. Now, a lot of people type their name there. They say, oh, nothing came up, and that's good, and that's inaccurate. No. So uh, the standard for <laughs> trademark infringement, right, what you need to concern yourself with is, is there a likelihood of confusion? Confusingly so it's similar. Yeah, no, yeah. exactly. <laughs> that is exactly right. Yeah, Section 2D of the Lanham Act. And uh, <laughs> how does one determine if something is too similar? So uh, once again, it depends, but... What it depends on is your jurisdiction. So in trademark land, and that's, you know, the Federal Circuit, the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, you know, that jurisdiction, they are called the DuPont factors, right? Like the paint company uh, in New York, it's the Polaroid factors. <clears throat> so, I mean, every jurisdiction has their own seminal case, but basically it's a set of factors that you examine, you know, your mark and the other mark, and you go down each of the factors one by one. And then in the totality of the circumstances, 
uh, you make a determination. Now that's useless for people at home. Well, let's get some practical advice here. There are three things that you should focus on when making your determination. The first is how similar are the marks, right? That's a pretty, pretty basic one, right? If it's Matt's apples cart and Matt's apple stand, well, like, you know, those are pretty similar. But if you searched Matt's apple cart in tests, yes. it wouldn't come up. But Matt's apple stand is, of course, too similar. People are going to get confused. So you want to look at the similarity of those marks. Are they visually similar? Are they phonetically similar? Do they create the same commercial impression? And um, then you make that analysis and either it weighs in favor of or against a likelihood of confusion. Then you drop it to the next level. The similarity of the goods or services being sold. And like, that's a really common one. So a lot of folks in the cannabis space like, oh, I'll go you know, get a mark on clothing, right? I'll file it for clothing and that'll protect the name, right? They have like a strain they want to get protection on. And, yep. you know, oh, I have a ton of questions on that. Because sure, yeah. I, 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 stuff uh, I hear all the time. So yeah. Yeah. I just, yeah. Yep. I wanted to start from the very beginning and then escalate to all the million cannabis questions. Oh, but, sure. um, yeah. A little, a little framework I think is good. But yeah. That's, that really is the challenge though, right? So like I, what I do is mostly federal law. And as you know, like marijuana is illegal under federal law. So like yeah. what intersections are there and how- So that, that I'm just going to stop you. That warrants yeah, yeah. Uh, saying for the audience, the reason this is such a big deal in cannabis is because trademarks are federal and cannabis is federally illegal. So you are trying to trademark something that you're not allowed to sell. So oh. if you, yeah. So if you want this on a national level, I mean, and we can get into states' rights and what you can do in individual states that have legalized- but so this is why it's such an important to an important thing to get a cannabis specific trademark attorney who knows how to go through this myriad of hurdles to get yeah, this done and yeah. has gotten every rejection under the sun related to this yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so you what, were, yeah, you were saying well, just yeah, one interesting thing about the federal bit and why it's a particularly bad idea to try to get a trademark on your strain of cannabis is part of getting a trademark is you have to show that you're selling it in interstate commerce. So if you validly apply for a trademark over your cannabis strain, you are submitting evidence to the federal yeah. government that you are selling a schedule one drug across state lines and you are just volunteering that up. So, uh, you know, aside from the fact that they'll reject it, you know, you're not making smart choices by yeah. going down that route. I, I, it's funny, my or lawyer, when we were doing an application, uh, someone who had grow experience was, you know, writing all their experience, but it was not all above board. And he was like, am I writing my own indictment here? <laughs> like, you know, it's, uh, yeah. And that always comes down to, well, people are looking for plant touching experience. How do you get plant touching experience when, you know, it was all illegal. So yeah, there's always these super gray areas. Um, so what is the different levels of I want to do CBD, I want to do ancillary, and I want to do plant touching. Okay. Now, yeah. Yeah, let's, do, let's start with plant touching. That's the easy one. If you're like a straight up plant touching business, just don't apply for a federal trademark. It's, it's not going to, at all. just don't, just wait. But you're not out of options though. So, right, if you're a plant touching, you're assuming, I'm assuming you're operating under state law. Okay, like you're operating mm -hmm. lawfully under state law. Well, there are state trademarks, right? You yeah. go to your, you know, the Department of Corporations normally does it, or I mean, every state calls a little bit different, but yeah, you file for your state trademark. And that's excellent because your state trademark is a validated record. You know, no one's gonna say that you falsified the state documents for the trademarks and you'll have evidence that as of whatever date you filed, you were selling this. So when it becomes federally legal, you know, and that's a when, not an if, you know, within yeah. both of our lifetimes, it will happen. Uh, well, then you're going to have really good evidence of your lawful use all the way back then. Now, yeah. the trademark office might try to pull something funny, say, oh, it wasn't lawful in interstate commerce when you did it. I, um, that could shake out a lot of different ways. I imagine that they'll carve out some special provision in whatever the federal legalization bill is to address folks who have been operating under state law, okay, right? And the feds aren't prosecuting those people. And, you know, they'll have to generate some rights. I I'm not now, sure. What are we going to see when we see so many dispensaries who were green wellness, relief, alternative, something, care, plant? Yeah. They just every state has the same, basically, dispensary names. So when you have one in California, one in Colorado, and one in, you know, Massachusetts, and there are three different corporations, how are they going to determine who actually gets that? 
that word. Mark. Well, um, so all of this comes down to like the framework. So cool thing about trademarks is that you get, at least in the US, you get rights just by using it. So mm -hmm. uh, this is actually a, a good story. My own law firm name, M.G. Miller. Uh -huh. I, I, you know, I like, you know, I started this company, just me in a room and, you know, it grew to the firm that we are today. But at the time, like I had limited funds and I opted to file for a trademark over the logo and not the name. And yeah. I was like, all right, well, you know, what's the likelihood there's going to be another M.G. Miller law firm that opens up, you know, in this short, you know, it was like a four month window before I decided to yeah. file on the name itself. Well, lo and behold, there's another Matt G. Miller down in Charleston who opens what? up M. G. Miller. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. So, so you would have common law for New Jersey, I'm guessing, right? But had he filed for a federal, or well, no, he so he hadn't, and actually at, hadn't. at the time, okay. I mean, I, I, we represent because what we do is federal. We, we represent clients all over the nation. So, like. I had, I mean, not, I don't represent someone in all 50 states, but you know, a lot of states. So I would have common law rights in the area that I did business in. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's New Jersey. I'm licensed in New York. Uh, we have a lot of California, a lot of Massachusetts, Colorado, Oregon, you know, the, the usual suspects, you know, for cannabis businesses. And uh, so I would have common law rights there. And then he would have common law rights where he did business, you know? So I shortly filed a trademark after that, you know, we're federally registered now, but because he was doing business in Charleston before I got my federal trademark, like I can't stop him from doing it. Now, you know, really? I check all the time and you know, other Matt, if you're watching, do not expand beyond <laughs> Charleston. I am keeping tabs, but <laughs> it's like- I'm so tagging him in this out. video. Yeah, right, you know, if he happens <laughs> to watch it. Uh, but no, it would be, so they would have, all these players would have the rights to use those names in their respective areas that they have been doing it under the current framework. So, but they wouldn't be allowed to expand once the well, they could try. whoever the first out the gate to get the federal trademark, then the rest of them would be stuck. Yeah, they could expand into the areas where, you know, there was no one operating with that. Now, okay. I'm sure some people will get mad and try to challenge it. And there is a bit more nuance as to like priority of use and what qualifies and what doesn't, it's mm -hmm. probably outside the scope of this. So there'll probably be legal challenges, but broad strokes, that's how it'll shake out. So the people who are looking for those um, national and even global trademarks, like the med men's of the world, how are they? Because I, I know, like you said, like, all right, the t-shirt thing isn't going to work, but you are allowed to apply for cannabis trademarks for, I believe, education, information, something like a podcast, clothing. Um, so are they applying for those at least in, say, in like Wisconsin and Alabama? to make sure they have, so, or are they doing CBD since now that's federally legal? What's the, the plan for the big guys and what can the little guys do? Yeah, so, well, the little guys can do the same thing that the biz, big guys can do. Now, I don't know exactly how MedMen is doing it, but I can say generally the multi-state operators actually do it through IP. So they get non-plant touching IP. Uh, maybe it's rolling papers, lighters, you know? So it's not, and I didn't, I didn't touch on like clothing. So the similarity of the goods you have to think about the natural expansion of stuff. So you know, if you have a chocolate shop, it's not crazy to think that you're gonna start selling ice cream. You know, like, yeah, it's a bit of a jump. You know, there are different components, but they're both sweets, treats, like that's yeah. an ordinary consumer wouldn't be shocked. If your chocolate shop started selling gasoline though, that would be pretty weird. That'd be weird, like you would be surprised. So that that's not a natural expansion of yeah. the services. So if what you're doing, you know, your class 34 goods, your smokers accessory you know, for tobacco use only, mm -hmm. uh, well, that's a, a pretty good thing to have, right? That's a reasonable place. So like uh, people who operate in the smokers article space, I would think my personal opinion is that it would be a reasonable expansion that they would extend into other areas such as the cannabis related stuff. So what these folks are doing is they're getting trademarks, they're getting patents over related things, not plant touching. So you're yeah. saying, hey, I'm offering information, right? Because I mentioned before, part of your trademark is you have to show the government that you're using it. Yeah. And well, if you're showing them that you're doing something lawful, such as disseminating information, well, that's that's okay, and they give you that trademark. And so you try to do it in a way that's related. Now, I don't think clothing is related to cannabis, really, aside from all these people trying to be cute with the trademark office. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So this is basically you're utilizing source confusion to your advantage. Is that a true statement? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now, is, has CBD been given its own uh, code? How is that? I, 
Yes and no. So uh, like perfect question. And the CBD is kind of a gray area, right? So for some folks, so not all uses of CBD are lawful. Real, actually, technically none, right? So what a weird regulatory scheme. So there is, let's, let's go biology, right? Like your kingdom phylum, you know, that whole taxonomy. So you have your uh, genus, Cannabis sativa L right? That's like a lot of cannabis plants, hemp, whatever. Then you have your species of marijuana, you have your species of hemp, and then there's like, I forget the names of the other ones, there's like some plant that they, that's native to India that's rich in THC, but part of the same family. Like there's a yeah, couple yeah. other. So your species of plants that you collect your CBD from determines the legality of that CBD, which it's fucking stupid. Uh, before I was a lawyer, I was a chemist. And I can tell you, like, these are chemically identical compounds. Yeah. It's, you know, cannabidiol. Like, that's, that's the compound. And whether you get it from marijuana or hemp or somewhere else, to me, shouldn't matter. But to the law, it absolutely does matter. So uh, back in the day, there was the 2014 Farm Bill. And they said, hey, you know, there's a thing. We're defining this thing called industrial hemp. And industrial hemp is not under the CSA. That's what it said. And then they said industrial hemp was mature stalks, sterilized seeds, and uh, one or two other portions of the plant that like- And, and with, CSA being the Controlled Substance Act. Yes, yeah, sorry, they could, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and they, these parts were said, oh, okay, well, these parts cannot contain THC. Uh, so they're not part of the Controlled Substances Act. And therefore, like they can be transferred between state lines lawfully. Then uh, people were like, wait a minute, these plants have not THC, but CBD, which has some use. It has some like market interest. So they started extracting CBD from the industrial hemp, you know, under this lawful thing. And the DEA got involved and said, no, well, like we can regulate all parts of the marijuana, not have the marijuana plant, including CBD. And then the, the Hemp Industry Association sued them and it went back and forth. The, H, the Hemp Industry Association won, like, really great job. They won that fight, and the DEA, the DEA had to issue a special directive saying, hey, if you're getting your CBD from hemp, it's fine. Now, that really muddied the waters, because, like, how do you prove that you're getting it from just these parts of the plants and not the other parts of the plant? Now, there are agencies that would certify this stuff, and you just kind of had to take them at their word. Um, but then... The Farm Bill of 2018 passed, right? That's the one that's mm -hmm. really popular. Sure, Mr. Yeah. McConnell was going for that. And so all that that did is it redefined how to distinguish from, from the law, marijuana and hemp. They said, hey, you know, forget what part of the plant that doesn't matter. It's any cannabis sativa L, right, our, our genus, mm -hmm. that has less than 0.3% THC by weight and provided your plants have less than that threshold, they are industrial hemp and not covered by the CSA. And any CBD products that are derived from that are lawful to possess and sell. So that's but, one end. Well, right. Yeah. But, okay. Yeah. Okay. But at the same time, CBD is classified as a schedule one drug. Uh, but at also at the same time, Epidiolex, a CBD derivative drug, is not schedule one. And okay, is, but so we recently have had some progress with Epidiolex being taken off of, um, was it they removed the patent or they made it um, over the counter? It was something. Epidiolex recently changed because that what was, was gumming up being able to put it in a dietary supplement or food with the FDA because you can't put something that's FDA regulated into something you eat. Yeah. You know, so, um, but didn't that recently change? And I was going to ask you, I know it helped a little bit with um, guidelines for regulating CBD. I was wondering if it affected the trademark or do you not know? You know, I, you know, I hadn't heard about that. I, I mean, I, I can say that I still am getting uh, FDA related rejections on stuff as recently as uh, two weeks ago. Oh, and you know, it's, it's June 3rd. So I, I mean, there is a bit of delay, right? It's not like these agencies yeah. talk to each other and in constant communication. So like, you know, it must come from the FDA and then it trickles its way down. So you know, maybe that's coming down the pike on the trademark side. Uh, yeah. TBD. For okay. For me. Uh, yeah. But no, that, that is interesting. I just, what, what I was getting, was getting at though was the hypocrisy of it, right? So it'd be qualified as a schedule one drug. There's no therapeutic use. 
but at the same time, there is an FDA approved drug stating its therapeutic use. And like, it's the same agency taking inconsistent and positions. Also has not the government owned the tra- patent or trademark for like 20 years on CBD as a neuroprotectant. So while yeah. it's been scheduled for two decades, they've actually known it to be useful. Yeah, uh, that's, that's hilarious. Like, and true. Yeah, they did. Um, I think it's off patent now. But still, like, yeah, the fact that they were pursuing this back then. I mean, we are preaching in the choir here, right? The, <laughs> like, all the craziness well, and yes. consistent treatment of For marijuana sure. and cannabis. Like, I, it's just, we know. If you're listening my, to this podcast. My, you know. I know. My hope is that people who are like, I don't know, on the fence seeking more information occasionally will come and I will convert them to the, from, from well, the dark side. <laughs> I hope, I hope to assist with that. <laughs> yeah, but no, but I do. Um, so within this podcast, I always try to get, cause I, I think we have listeners who are just starting out a business who, you know, maybe just want to do something small. They're, they're looking, they have, you know, a small amount of money. They're looking to invest. And they want to do it cheaply. And then I think we have people, you know, I have friends who own dispensaries, who have licenses, who are you know, in a much different stage. Um, so let's talk about both, but let's start with the little guy. When I started, um, I had a friend do something on legal zoom for me, you know, it was super cheap. Um, and then someone told me, look, you just have to have the first use in commerce. So put up a PayPal button, sell one to a friend, preferably in another state, take a screenshot of the sale, mail it to yourself in an envelope. Don't open it. He said, now go when you have money, do the other stuff, but start there. Um, how, how shady and ridiculous is that? I, well, it seems like you conflated <laughs> two things, right? So there's uh, uh, like everything you said with the trademark is true. You actually don't have to sell. Uh, you just have to like legitimately offer to sell. Uh, so there's some yeah. folks who like- You could file, so you could file intent to use, but that's not something people who are plant touching can enjoy, right? But can Well, people CBD, who are plant touching can't enjoy- They can't file it, but can- Regardless. Can, can you with CBD do intent yeah. to use? You can, okay. You can, so yeah, the, the intent to use versus um, use-based is uh, really, it's just a procedural thing. It, it would stem, I'll keep it brief, stem from the pharmaceutical industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, believe it or not, like those names like Viagra or Fosamax, they spend millions of dollars developing those names. Like so many studies and testing, it's crazy. And they have such a lot of them really dumb names, but they pour a ton of, a ton of money into this. Uh, however, often they would apply this before the intent to use existed, they would apply, find out that they can't get it and have to go back to the drawing board after spending millions of dollars. And that was unacceptable to the pharmaceutical industry. So they used their lobbying dollars and the intent to use application was born. You can get your trademark rights and get the green light from the government before you're actually using it. Now, while you get the green light from the government, it's not your full registration. You receive what's called a notice of allowance. And then you have time frame, six months, extendable up to three years to submit your evidence of use to the government. And then you'll mature into a registration. So, you know, if you have like a really great brand, I always tell clients, cause like I, I do a lot of patent work too, uh, like cannabis and non-cannabis related. And I always tell folks like, what's special about your company, right? Like you say day one, like what are people coming to from an IP standpoint? Like, what are you worried people are gonna steal? Did yeah. you invent something new that's really cool? Is your branding on point? You know, do you have like, cool slogans or design, like what, what is it that makes it special? And then that's what you need to focus on protecting. So if your branding is great and like, that's really all that you have, you know, you're going to just be a me too business, but you happen to uh, have great branding. Like you're super creative. Well, like that's awesome. Like file for your trademark before you even get going, like file your intent to use, get that in there. And then, you know, then you can go about marketing. And if you talk to somebody like, you know what, that is a great name. And they go try to get it for themselves. Well, it'll be too late because you filed your intent to use, and you know, you have your preliminary rights as of your filing date, and then provided so, that you use it in commerce, you get your full rights. Yeah. So, uh, if you say have this great name that you love it, in exactly that situation, but you're just kind of starting out, each trademark uh, you have to file per category, and I think each one is like two twenty five. So yeah, let's. Or- or about that more? It's 225 or 275. There's two versions, not worth getting okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah the, the, the DIYer version or quick version or something. Yeah, but, quick version is 225 a class. Yes, I know too much, more than I should about this stuff. <laughs> um, but so let's say you're starting out and you want to do a CBD line and you're going to be doing cosmetics and edibles and cartridges and all these different products, types. Um, but you don't want to pay two seventy five each and spend you know three thousand dollars on trademarks out the gate. Um, is there a way to do it broadly where people can maybe just get a couple trademarks and cover themselves, or is that just looking for trouble? 
No, I think you can. I mean, because yeah, you, you do want to manage the cost, right? Most, like a thousand plus dollars in government fees is ridiculous. Like yeah. that's not a good use of your startup company's money. Now, if you have infinite funds, sure, but like that's rarely the case. Yeah. So it comes back to that natural expansion I was talking about, right? Maybe you don't go all the classes that you want to do, but okay, well, like, uh, let's take cosmetics, for example, right? You know, often people who sell co cosmetics also sell scented candles, right? Or bath bombs, right? That's like a pretty common pairing that I see. So if someone like I would say, okay, well, you want protection over all those things, you could probably choose one. And it's, you know, it's not perfect, but it's something because mm -hmm. look at our analysis. If someone's coming with the same or similar name, that first factor is going to be too similar. Then if the goods are really similar or, you know, a natural expansion, like an ordinary consumer would be like, yeah, I could see the same company selling both of those. Well, then you've covered yourself without explicitly listing that. Now, I mean, yeah. it comes with some risk because maybe your opinion of what a natural expansion is, is different than a jury of your peers, but yeah, it's maybe it's not. So it, yeah. it's kind of tough to say, um, but just some things. So in terms of CBD, you really have to be careful with how you say you're going to use it. Cause exactly like if it's a dietary supplement, you're not, you're not getting your trademark, right? You can't mm -hmm. show lawful use. You know, if you claim any kind of medicinal benefit, well then you've fallen under the jurisdiction of the food, drug and cosmetic act. And unless you're, you know, unless you've filed your new drug application with the FDA, like you're not lawfully using that. And mm. it's weird. It's same product. It's just how you're characterizing it. So like just your, I think mood elevation has been fine, right? That's been something that's okay. Wait, uh, there, there, the, there's a class called mood elevation. Well, no, be a, something for elevating one's mood. So uh, okay. medicated products are class five, right? Whether it's, uh, you know, anti burn cream, whether it's uh, hemorrhoid medication, all, all of that is in this, all medicines are in the same class. Mm -hmm. So, um, that would be true for you know any of your your CBD medicines. You just want to be yeah. careful with how you phrase it. Uh, you know, herbal extracts like pretty great. You don't have to say what it's for or how what you're doing. It's just like, hey, I sell this stuff. You know, terpenes are really good. Like various terpene profiles are great hmm. ways for like easy to protect, completely lawful to have. So it really um. So let let's, let's say with that example, you were starting that CBD line and you mm -hmm. sold cosmetics, smokable products, and edibles. What would be, and the person says, I want one trademark. What's the most important one you would say, do this? Probably the smokables, provided smokables. that you can get those through. Well, because if you think about the natural expansion, right? If you are selling smokables, infused products is a natural expansion from that, I would mm -hmm. say. I just, you know, knowing the industry and how it goes. So if you had to choose it, I would choose the one that provides the easiest path to show that you're related to the others. And do, you, based on that. do you face more regulation going for is smokable product? That sounds like something that would be more regulated. Um, not really. I mean, yeah, I, from a trademark standpoint, no. I mean, oh, cool. It, it's weird. I mean, there's just not a ton of regulation around the CBD stuff. So pre-COVID and all of this, like, I actually got to say, New York State, like Cuomo, is way ahead of the curve. They were proposing an insane, like, huge regulatory scheme over growers over the people who sold it, like it was going to become fully regulated. Yeah. And you know, yeah, a lot of my clients were like, fuck, uh, you know, but it's, it was just, that would have been the regulation. So as far as I know, I don't know of any federal regulation blocking this stuff because it's really, it's like most of the concern is, well, are you violating the Controlled Substances Act or not? And then so beyond that, it's just, you know, the FDA, but there's just few, few prohibitions I've seen because it's so new. So I heard something that was interesting slash scary, and I don't know if it was only intent to use or if it was people already using their marks in commerce, but it said, if you have an existing, whichever of those it was, um, after 12-20-2018, uh, which is the farm bill, you had to amend it to, set, to like basically refile as, you know, now it has CBD in it. And that whoever filed first, if there were two competing marks, even if one was in use longer, the person who filed soonest, amended soonest after 1220 would be the person who would actually get the mark. Is that true? Is it like a race to refile now? Yes and no. So this is something actually for one of my clients, I've been duking it out with the trademark office a lot. Because what's frustrating is like, you could still sell lawful CBD prior to 12-20-2018. You could, that was the whole HIA lawsuit against the DIA and they won that. And 
there was a framework and it was a different framework and required different certifications, but it was perfectly possible. Now, you know, you have to try to drill that in the examining attorney's heads. You know, uh, you know, there are some excellent attorneys at the trademark office uh, and there are other attorneys at the trademark office. So it kind of depends on who you get. Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, so I've been, I've been fighting that. It, it is possible, but you have to show your compliance paperwork. So in that situation, it would be who was lawfully using it first, right? So if you were on, if both parties weren't compliant on the 2014 farm bill, yeah, it would be a race to who amended first, right? Because you were both doing it illegally. The first one to amend was the first person to lawfully use it as far as they were concerned from like an ITU standpoint and intent to use standpoint. And that would be that. However, if one of them could show that they were lawfully using it under the old framework, it would be the person who used it first. Interesting. So, and, and to amend it, you actually, there's, you were saying smokables, whatever, there's an actual CBD class that you have to add, or you just have to state it. I'm, I'm confused on that. Sure, sure. So, uh, well, the amendment part is just, uh, you just write, it's like a miscellaneous statement you put in, you say, I'd like to, I hereby amend my date to whatever. <laughs> and yeah. then like, there's a, a co some code citation and you drop that in there. And that, that's just, that's an easy one. Yeah. In terms of the classification, that's, it's just, it's just different. So CBD alone isn't going to, there's no CBD class. That's like just not a class. It's, it's what you are doing with it, right? So let's say you have CBD isolate. Mm -hmm. That'd be a chemical. That'd be class one. Now I don't have a, per there's, there are 45 classes. Classes one through 34 are various types of goods and classes 35 through 45 are various types of services. Hmm. So uh, legal services, class 45, you know? <laughs> Uh, educational services, class 41, the podcast would probably be under that as well. Cool. Uh, so uh, yeah, right. We filed for your other stuff, but if you, you wanted this, that that's how it would go. And it just depends on which class that you're in, what you're selling, what are you doing with the CBD? Where are you putting it? And depending on what you're putting it in will depend on what class that you're going in. Uh, a lot of people focus on like, oh, this class or that class more important what words you choose to describe it. And that's the big difference between your 225 version and your 275. So at 225, you have to choose from a list of pre-approved descriptions. It's long. It's like last time I checked it was like 45 or 46,000 entries. Like there's a fair bit of stuff that you can just do. And that's awesome. And that's wow. great. And if that works for what you're doing, fantastic. You save yourself 50 bucks a class. However, I don't know. I work with a lot of innovators. A lot of these folks are doing something that just cannot be described by any of the pre-approved descriptions or not really. So the extra 50 bucks buys the opportunity to perfectly craft the words you use to describe what you're selling. Because oh. a lot of time, and now, now that you can have clothing, that's too broad, but let's just say for this example, you could. If I were to put clothing, well, that's going to cover all types of clothing. So there's like People have to think like, oh, you know, hats with cool designs on them, shoes that light up. Like, you don't need to get that specific. You want to go broader, right? So like, fuck the class. If you get the class wrong, the trademark office will say, hey, you filed in this class, but I think you mean this class. And as long as you're not adding anything, there's no fee and no real penalty for it. So like, people don't, shouldn't get bogged down in that. It's really, it's the words that you use. That's what's important. And that's like, often where the skill of an attorney comes in is helping you get that description of what you're selling in exactly right. Cause you know, yeah. the trademark form itself, it has instructions on what to do. Yeah. Now, if you take your time, I tell clients all the time, like if you're smart and patient, you can absolutely do your trademark yourself. You uh, know, I, I was, I was going to do my renewal myself to be honest. And I got through it and it needed a spot for your like bar number. And I was like, I'm sure I could like phone a lawyer friend and have them give it to me. But I was like, you know what? I should just genuinely give it to a lawyer <laughs> oh well fun, fun fact uh you could yeah. leave that blank uh oh, you can. Actually, okay <laughs> uh, well yeah so uh many things have changed with the current administration uh but one of the things that changed is that trademarks foreign countries you're sorry foreign companies can must use a u.s attorney if they want to file in the u.s like you cannot represent yourself for this you have to use a u.s attorney and so a change with that is they started making people verify this stuff right What's your bar number? What year were you admitted? What state were you admitted in? Are you still in good standing? And 
uh, that's part of it. So you actually could have left that blank as a you know domestic company. Oh, no. but, yeah. uh, <laughs> say well, I, I, I think I think you're making an excellent case for why you need a trademark attorney, though, because this is a very compliment. I, I if I had not been sued and spent and I, I, I represent myself in a lot of that. Um, if I had not done that, I would not have touched any of this because it's super confusing to the average person and you could definitely put your time into something better for your business than learning all this. For yes. Sure. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's where most of my, all right, most of my clients are pretty smart folks. And they're like, Matt, like, I'm sure I could do it, but I don't want to please. Yeah. This for yeah. Me. You I'm could like, definitely. Yeah, no problem. yeah. But it's, um, so now what about in a global thing? So this, I feel like our industry, we have to care about this a little bit more than normal. Cause let's say you had that apple cart. I'm not too worried about apple carts in Canada, but when I have a giant country that legalized my industry before me, that has a, you know, a stock market industry and like interstate commerce and all these things. And my country doesn't now I'm worried about what they're doing up there and who's going to come down with a ton of money and try to do something. Cause all the countries, all the, really big operators in America right now, a lot of them are working over in Canada, just sitting there looking over the fence, waiting for us to legalize. So when that happens and they all come in, what do we need to do now to make sure we're protected? Yeah, and it's, as you said, it's doing stuff now. It's having pre-existing IP rights. So I, I've like, you know, given IP and cannabis talks at like various industry shows. I'm always like, do it now. Like when <laughs> yeah. the new guys come in, it's too late. Yeah. So, because like, honestly, like having a registered patent or a registered trademark is amazing. You can, if those folks want to come down and let's say they want to use your technology or want to use your brand, well, they have to pay. And yeah. uh, some for valuable, like valuable trademarks, <laughs> that's a ton of money, six, seven yeah. figures it can be. So like, you know, just file for something now. I mean, don't, don't falsify stuff. Like if you're not using it, don't file for it. But like, if you're building a brand down here and like, Someone in Canada wants to take advantage of the goodwill you've built, well, they got to pay for that. And if you have a trademark, if not, then you're going to be limited to your little geographic region that you've been doing business in. Yeah. And you know, you're going to let the operators go everywhere else. Is or there... they can just crush you in court with legal fees, which is a sad truth of litigation in America. So wait, is there like a black market aftermarket for that? Like people looking at companies in Canada who might want to come here and scooping up their US trademarks and looks of in hopes of being bought out long term it could be uh you know on the trademark side of things i don't know but like it happens with domain names all the time oh, right? i domain used to name do that prospecting yeah. is insane Some yeah. people make good money off of that <laughs> yeah I've, I've had a few good wins i bought uh what's it cannabis domains like way too early and then okay. when you're, you're re-registering them all for like a decade you're like all right i don't i don't know if this is going to pay off at a certain point start releasing a lot of them but uh yeah but i i own, I own some cool ones that maybe i'll do something with but um, so with the Canadian thing, what was the other thing I was going to say? Um, how do you protect yourself from, or yeah, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. Cause I forgot. So it'll come. Uh, yeah. I mean, basically it's just getting, you're just getting your stuff in advance. Now I would not recommend if there's like, you know, a large Canadian operator, like just filing for something on their name. Like that's, oh yeah, yeah the international aspect. That's what, so how do we get protection elsewhere? So, I mean, yeah. in terms of folks coming in, you got to get your protections in the U S yeah. IP rights are granted on a per nation basis. So you want rights in the U.S., you file in the U.S. You want rights in Canada, you file in Canada, you know, Mexico. Europe's a little bit weird. There's a European, like a European collective group, but then you still have to nationalize in the country. It's, it's just an extra wrinkle. But you're, I, I, look, I feel like I sound like an idiot. I'm like, yeah, you got to go to all these countries, Canada, <laughs> Mexico, Europe. And like, I know Europe's not a country, but like in effect for this stuff, it is. But I just... I honestly, it didn't, it didn't even register when you said that. Okay. But so, so like the, the first step, um, I called Denver a state once. So, um, yeah. Oh, well when, so the very first step I said, when someone's starting their business and they're thinking of the name is Canadian companies a consideration if you're in cannabis where normally you wouldn't care. That's a good question. I don't think it can hurt, but yeah. no, I kind of just like, I'd focus if you're a small player, focus on getting one sale, uh, right? Like, you know, Peter Thiel at zero to one, like that's good advice. Like, don't, don't worry about some yes. giant company out there. Like, you know, if you, once you start making sales, yes, do worry about that then. But like when you're just getting started, like get your ducks in a row, form an LLC or a corporation, right? Yeah. File for some IP, like get 
a retail space or build your e-commerce site. Like those are like, there are key building yeah. blocks just for getting your first sale that I think a lot of people uh, kind of just look too far ahead and don't yeah. focus on like the I immediate just, stuff. May, may, maybe I'm a little scorned, but I'm scorned with so much in cannabis. When you start in 2009, you really just, yeah. Well, yeah I was going to say, you're an OG. Like, yeah, you, you, a lot of it. <laughs> you've just been battered and bruised so much. You're so traumatized. But um, I, I think it's just because I started and I lost my trademark three or four years in. So at that point, you lose all the media you've got in your social media, all the booth materials, all your marketing materials, everything has to be, you know, just light a match, burn it, start over, kill all your pages. And it's really, uh, it's really heartbreaking, you know, reprint all your products, all your packaging is garbage. Um, so, I mean, it's just the idea of like an ounce of prevention. Of course, you should be thinking of the very basic building blocks, but it doesn't hurt to think in case you nail all those things and it goes well let's make sure we have a strong foundation. So that's absolutely, cool. absolutely. And I mean, if for, for folks having a trademark search done or like clearing your name early on is a good idea. Uh, but I think you can just focus on the U S for now. Like, yeah, the international operators are, you know, you're, you're probably not going to stop them, right? Unless you're yeah. really well capitalized or really well lucky or some combination of both. You're just, it's, it's probably not going to happen. I would focus yeah. on protecting your, your little acre, you know, what you're doing, make that as strong as possible. And as the people want to come in, like if you built up your protections, like that's going to have to suffice. I mean, or you can order huge freedom to operate opinions from really big fancy firms and spend, you know, a hundred thousand dollars on, you know, maybe unnecessarily. Yeah. I don't know about that. Freedom to operate. What's that? I don't know. Uh, well, let's say you want to, so it's more in the patent space. Let's say you invent a product. And you want to make sure that no one else has a patent that's too close to you uh, mm. before you start manufacturing and selling. You ask some, you ask an attorney or a firm to do research and say, hey, what patents are out there? Do uh, kind of analysis and yeah. then tell me, am I free to operate in this space? So let's talk patents real quick because uh, I'm so trademark obsessed here. But like you said, a lot of people try to patent a strain and I'm sure also um, growing and extraction equipment. I'm thinking that's probably a little easier because you could say it's for all sorts of uses, growing tomatoes, extracting, you know, essential oils of different types. But um, how about something like a strain that's really difficult or, or are you seeing difficulty across the board? Well, so the patent office, it's, it's funny. So the patent office doesn't give two shits. They'll let you get a patent on basically <laughs> anything that's new, novel, and not obvious. It's actually, uh, the case is really interesting. Uh, really, it's just the name is so funny. The seminal case on this is Juicy Whip versus Orange Bang. Like a really <laughs> memorable case today. Uh, but basically, it had to do with uh, products meant to deceive. And, uh, you know, like you go to 7-Eleven, they have the machines that spin the slushies up top. Yep. So that is, that is called a pre-mix beverage. And while people love seeing it slosh up there, it actually is a far, it's like a really crappy beverage compared to the post mix where they like, it gets mixed as you dispense. So uh, one of the parties, I forget which, made a device that has a fake spinning thing up top to bring people in, like that, that fake juice that's not really served, but actually offers a post mix beverage in there. And uh, I, the suit was basically like, this is a device meant to deceive. It's immoral. It's unlawful. And the patent office is like, we don't care. Like, we care about utility. Yeah. We care about novelty. Like, yeah. if, that's other, if that other stuff is wrong, that's fine. There are other agencies for it. That's not the patent office's purview. Yeah. That's been the standard. So in terms of, like, illegality, like, people – don't uh, the patent office doesn't really care there are patents on strains of cannabis you know what it may sound weird but i actually find that really refreshing that they've left all morality out because <laughs> i feel like in cannabis so much you hear like well that's wrong and the children and this and that and you're always like these are this has nothing to do with my business this is your opinion on cannabis legalization and so it's actually kind of nice that they left that out i i mean business as a whole could probably use more morals, but just in this very particular yeah. use. <laughs> well, funny you say that. It's actually the IP realm is moving away from moral judgment. So there is a, a big case. So uh, everybody knows about the Washington Redskins, the football team. Yeah. And, uh, you know, every, it's like every 15 years or so, some group tries to challenge their trademark because it's like pretty fucking offensive. I don't care what they say. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's bad. They should change it. But they have too much equity talking about changing your name and having to yeah. burn and write a match. Like <laughs> they're not prepared to do that. Dan Snyder's not prepared to do that. Yeah. Uh, the owner of the Redskins. And 
they so but people challenge it and they say hey like this is a scandalous and immoral mark like there are uh, there was a thing in the trademark side that said hey scandalous moral offensive marks are not registrable material and you know the redskins managed to weasel their way out of it but how they weasel their way out of it this time is exceptionally clever uh so there is uh they didn't go to bat they let so, so they at the federal circuit the court uh, one of the courts right beneath the supreme court they lost and then they took a step back because there's a way more favorable case. Uh, there's this band out in California, they're all Asian Americans, and the band name is called The Slants. And uh, they've been going on, they've been playing for like over a decade. And the, the leader of the group is like, I'm taking this name back, right? Like, this is something I want to yeah, do, yeah. I want to do this. And like, they, but it's a legitimate band, they've been doing it for a while. And this guy, Tam, I, I forget his last name, that's like Ace, uh, the Maytality Tam, and he said, no, 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 it's not for the government to decide what is or is not immoral. Like, I have this right to do it. And lo and behold, he wins. So hmm. Tam wins the really favorable case. Oh, you know, these guys are taking this back. But what's the ramification? Well, the section uh, of the Lanham Act used to cancel the Redskins mark is unconstitutional and therefore invalid. And therefore, the Redskins will be keeping this mark for a while. Wow. I so wait, I don't know their involvement, but I, you know, it's very you know, qui bono right like i have to imagine that they were involved that, somehow wow really you think it's that like the owner of the redskins was like hey guys start a band i'll fund you well, no no no. i don't think it's that <laughs> but he's like hey if you want to go to supreme court i'll pay your legal bill you know it could have been uh, something like that because you know going to supreme court not cheap <laughs> yeah yeah that makes sense yeah a couple guys who started a band in california that yeah wow so do you yeah. did, did that like open up like can the kkk get a trademark now yeah, they could. I mean, there is wow. uh well, it's actually, it's, it's sad. So some people are really funny about it. They got various uh, trademarks on like all kinds of curses and stuff. Uh, and then, well, it's both good and bad. So then some people started to register other racial slurs uh, for nefarious purposes, right? Like people who, you know, were just trying to take advantage of this new law. But then, and there's a couple articles, there were like activist groups, people who went and filed a trademark on various slurs to own it and prevent others from abusing the system. Ah. So it was kind of like, uh, it was good, you know, yeah, oh, there's oh, people oh, abusing Oprah it. does that. She buys up like racist dolls and like things and oh, she just, no yeah, she just burns them to like, yeah, preventative racism basically, which is yeah. a so, pretty so cool thing. That. Yeah. Yeah. But so the, actually the morality is leaving this stuff, but to, but back to the original question, you know, patents and cannabis and all yeah. this stuff. So if you want to get a patent on a strain of cannabis, how the first one did it is they focused on the novelty. So there is, uh, in biology, there's your genotype. So you have, you know, your gene sequence and, oh, okay, like, that's good. This gene, like, we know these genes do these things and express in this certain way, your phenotype. So, uh, you know, we don't know everything about genetics, but we know enough to say, hey, if your genetics look like this, we think you're going to make a plant that looks like A. Uh, these folks said, hey, like we have these cool genetics, but it actually makes a plant like B. And that's novel and non-obvious and we would like a patent. And then someone said, you know what? Yes, you can have that. And that was, uh, I think, November of 2018. So or it's, been, it's oh, you know, a while ago now. Or maybe, no, maybe 2016. I think I'm getting old. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> November 2016. Uh, right? And crazy, craziness that that happened. So the strains are totally fine, but they wow. it's really like the patent office, they focused on the novel genetics. Now, a lot of, this is a common misconception. They're like, oh, well, there's a plant patent. That's what I want. Plant patent is not what you want. It's, uh, you would think it would be because it has the name that really would make you think it's a plant patent. Uh, the problem with, with plant patents is that you have to asexually reproduce the plants. So that's just a huge hurdle and like very few things are truly asexually reproduced, like at least when you're making new genetics. So what people want is something called the Plant Variety Protection Act. And hmm. the PVPA, it's basically a patent issued by the US Department of Agriculture and it's, it's the same rights. Now, for folks trying to do that for cannabis, uh, much like your know, trademarks for the PVPA, you have to send in seeds, sample seeds of your genetics to federal seed banks. Huh. So if you're sending cannabis uh -oh. seeds to federal seed banks, again, you are really submitting evidence <laughs> of your violation of the That's law. That's worse. Yeah. To the federal, yeah, like even the trademark, like, yeah, you certify, you send pictures, but this you're sending hard <laughs> evidence to. 
So um, you know, you're probably not going to get it on cannabis, but now with hemp, right? If you have less than 0.3% THC by weight, I don't see any reason why you couldn't go for the PVPA. So that's interesting. Um, that I did want to talk about grandfathering and maybe this is how that would happen. Like, what if, like, I really want a tiramisu strain. I keep throwing that out. If anyone wants to grow it, I would love you. Um, but so let's say I, I have someone who wants to grow my tiramisu strain. Yeah. Um, now, if they were able to grow it in hemp and apply for the patent on that, would they have any ownership of the name to transfer that name when we have federal legalization? Uh, no, nah, because that's so uh, different legal instruments are different, right? So patents protect your innovations, a uh, new composition of matter, apparatus, system, whatever. It's a oh, duh. Something I always think described that. by words. The trademark yeah. protects, you know, your mark, your name in connection with the sale of what you're selling. So if you wanted, you know, patents, you could say, hey, anyone else who's growing the tiramisu strain, yeah, that's patent infringement. You need to stop. However, yes. if someone wanted to call a different strain tiramisu, that would be a violation of the trademark rights. So you really like they're different. I so always the same agency, but they're actually like protect different elements of what you're trying to do. I always confuse that with so the second time on strain conversation. I've done that. But so, yeah, so really what people are wanting to do is say, don't um, copy my genetics, which, right. and Precisely. you're basically saying there's no way to do that right now. Well, no, no, there is a way. So if you file for your patent genetics, it's fine, but you have to show that they're novel genetics. You're not going to get your PVPA for marijuana, but you might get it for hemp. Uh, okay. But yeah. the problem with getting it, so I'm like someone brought this up uh, at one of the talks, like one of the early talks I was giving, I look like an idiot. Uh, Cause it's a really good point. He's like, so all right. he's like, all right, Matt, you get a patent on cannabis, right? I was like, yeah. He's like, and then you go to federal court to enforce that patent. I was like, hmm. <laughs> Cause no, no, you wouldn't. Right. Then you're going to federal court and saying, Hey, I'm growing marijuana. Yeah. Like, uh, that's not really something that's going to get litigated in federal court. So while you can get these protections, it's like on the patent end, it's mostly prophylactic. Now, uh, patents last for 20 years. I would bet that we get federal legalization within the next two decades. So I, I don't think it's a waste so. of money, yeah. uh, at least on the strains. Now, basically everything else is open season, right? So uh, GW Pharma, people who make up a dialect, they have a shit ton of patents on a ton of THC and CBD derivatives for pharmaceutical formulations, right? So hmm. they took these plants and then went and did something else with it. So uh, that's one way to go. And again, you're running for the pharmaceutical stuff. You have all the FDA regulations. So for you know smaller folks, that's probably not economically viable just for the cost of clinical trials and all of that. Yeah. Uh, but other related stuff too. So extraction companies, yeah, that's huge. You know, I, I represent a pretty big one and yeah, we've gotten great patents for them and it's awesome. And uh, you know, you can get trademarks too over like the same equipment. So like any ancillary business, like even if you are processing, well, what you're selling is lab equipment, right? Yeah. And as long as you truthfully say you're selling lab equipment, well, the trademark office is probably going to give you that trademark, you know, barring that everything else is okay. So your ancillary businesses are, are pretty good. You should get that going now. Like if you're interested in selling shovels in this green rush, like <laughs> do it, get your protection. Like that's now is the time. Yeah. For sure. That's all really interesting. So I, I think last thing, have you seen any discrimination? Because I, well, two things. There's, there's always things in cannabis tend to cost more. We always have a green tax of doing things, you know, five times harder yeah. and longer than everyone else. And then also, I feel like we get picked on more. So um, are there people who would use the say, it's like the confusingly similar something to say, I don't want my product associated with drugs. So I'm going to pick on this company and try to get them to stop using it, even though if it was really just a normal widget, they maybe wouldn't care. I haven't seen anything like that. No? I have seen a lot of valid assertions of stuff. So you see it all over. Like people will do uh, like Kit Kat bars or Reese's or Hershey's and they'll like heavily borrow from the branding of those existing candy yeah, companies to yeah. make their infused. And I'm like, that's straight up trademark infringement, right? Like yeah. you are trying to advance your brand by copying the branding of someone else. That's like exactly uh, yeah. what the system is for. So I have seen valid, what I view as valid assertions of these rights against some of these smaller actors, but I haven't seen what I would call like picking on or, you know, 
anything unfair like that. Oh, no. But that said, well, that good. is why celebrities uh, often trademark their children's names is so they can control the use of that. Right? Is that why they name them like weird things? Uh, well, yeah, I don't know about that. Where you think of like Elon Musk or whatever. I, I don't understand what he and Grimes were thinking. Like, I guess it's Kyle, but it's like done in the most bizarre way. Are you familiar with this? No, I didn't hear that. So, yeah, they named it, uh, it, it like the child is like 12, the AE symbol, whatever that is, and like two other bizarre characters. Oh, really? Uh, look it up. It's, it's weird, but in terms of like the strength of the <laughs> but trademark. You, could, you couldn't name your kid Mike and trademark it, right? Like, no, oh. probably not. It would depend on what you're selling it for, right? So a trademark Well, no, is- no your, your child. Well, right. So when you Oh, I thought you were selling your child. Selling your child. No, no, no. <laughs> when you file a trademark, you have to say what you're going to sell with it, right? So all these celebrities who trademark their child's name, it's not like you get to use it for all goods, right? That's a common misconception. Your trademark is a two-pronged right. It's your mark in connection with the sale of goods or services. So again, right, Matt's apple cart, if I sell... You know, let's say gasoline again, right? Matt's apple cart sells gasoline. Okay. I can't stop someone from using Matt's apple cart to sell apple pies, right? Like that's probably too different, I would say. You know, it's it's just, it depends, <laughs> right? Come in full circle that it depends, but it, it really does. So you just it's, want It's funny, to... my, my cousin, her, our, my one of the family names is Smith. So her last name is Smith. And uh, yeah, she sells candy apples and she oh, misses Smith's apple pies. And she was thinking of selling apple pies. So it's very funny you said that. And she's like, I don't think I can use my name. Cause like, even though I'm Mrs. Smith, she's Mrs. Smith. So, but um, yeah. well, well, that's, I mean, the use of surnames is like a really interesting one. There's like a whole bunch of case law. Cause like, that's not fair. You should be allowed to start a business with your own name. Like yeah. that's, that, I don't know, it seems un-American to not be yeah. able to do it. And like most of the time you can. Unless really? it's like oh. a really famous mark that like really uh let's let's just say your last name was Pepper, right? And then you went and got your medical degree <laughs> and then you wanted to start selling Dr. Pepper soda. Like, no, that's fucking bullshit. Right? Yeah, like, yeah. You're taking advantage of the Dr. Pepper name, even though that's your name. Yeah. Uh, so it, but so except in very specific. That's funny. Right, oh, right. Cool. And, and it comes into an interesting interplay with the other MG Miller though, right? Like how would that work out? You know those chickens haven't come home to roost, uh, fortunately, but that's interesting. Like, could I stop him? I, I think so, but he would be right to be like, this is my name. And I'll be like, well, you could have had Matt Miller law or any other name. You didn't have to choose MG Miller. That's probably how we would fight it out. But the use of surnames is uh, like a call a special case in trademark mm-hmm. land. Interesting. All right, Matt, this has been awesome. This was like super informative. Um, I, I'm sure we could still keep going down wormholes. Oh, yeah, for... yeah, no, it's, it's yeah. fine. Like, really, I just, as you said it, like, this is boring as shit to most people. So I really try to bring yeah. it home and like <laughs> make it engaging. Cause yeah, it's like, I'm a car mechanic, right? Like, you know, your business needs IP, your car will break, yeah. right? Like it's, yeah. it's gonna happen. Like you will need it eventually. Uh, but oh, like, yeah. you know, very few people are excited about the car stuff. Yeah, there's like your gearheads or whatever, but the vast majority of people don't really care about what the mechanic does to their car. They just yeah. want it fixed. And I, I get it. I get it. I think it's cool, but I'm uh, one of the few. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's awesome about cannabis is they take all the things that people hate already, like banking, accounting, payment processing, insurance, trademarks, and they make them five times as hard so you get to spend even more time doing it. But that's uh, All the price to pay for being in the industry that we love. <laughs> yes. Right? Awesome. Yay, Green Rush. Um, <laughs> all right, Matt, this was really cool. Tell people where they could get in touch with you if they want to protect themselves. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the best place is our website, mgmiller.legal. Uh, but really, I take the job of making IP less boring and more interesting pretty seriously. So um, check out our Instagram. We're like just shy of 10,000 followers. Yeah, I like nice. to post interesting stuff. Um, and like, please check it out. I'll write about whatever you guys want. We have an interesting blog. Uh, but yeah, mgmiller.legal, our, all our tags on social media are at mgmillerip. And, um, you know, reach out, come say, hey, I love to chat about this stuff. Awesome. And uh, what states are you in? And if not, I imagine you could recommend people in other states too. Yeah. yeah. So for uh, our offices in Manhattan, 
Uh, I'm currently in New Jersey right now where I live because of uh, COVID. And, oh, but uh, wait, you could file federally from any state or? Precisely, yeah. Oh, so for okay. the federal work that we do, we can represent clients from any state, any nation. Actually, to do the patent work, I had to take a separate bar exam. There's a patent bar that oh. enables me to do patent work. I mean, trademark any licensed U.S. attorney can. Um, but yeah, folks from wherever. That said, if you need help with your application in a state that's not New Jersey or New York, I, I can't help you. Uh, happy yeah. to recommend some folks, and I know some great Colorado and Massachusetts attorneys, but um, yeah, I can't, can't really help with that. But in terms, as far as it comes to patents, trademarks, copyrights, uh, I'd love to help. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank and you. Uh, yeah, have a good one. Stay safe, everyone. Yeah. All right. Bye, guys. Thanks for listening. Bye.